you very much, sir. I'm very happy to be here um, associating with this particular edition of ICA webinars, where we are trying to bring in the voice of the future. So far, we have done postgraduate uh, pro-con debates, and now we are moving into a new format of uh, postgraduate seminars uh, so that the youngsters will uh, come on to this stage. I'm very glad that uh, we have an August panel of uh, moderators. Uh, they are uh, well accomplished uh, in their respective fields and well sought after teachers as well. Uh, it's my proud privilege to uh, welcome uh, Dr. J.V. Divatya, Dr. Anup Kumar, and uh, Dr. Shakti Bedanda Mishra as moderators for today's session. Welcome, sirs. Today's topic or the theme is ARDS, Current and Evolving Concepts. And in this edition, we would try to listen to uh, the youngsters, the residents. They will be presenting the subtopics as seminar topics. We have uh, uh, three dynamic postgraduates, Dr. Cherry and Roy, DM Critical Care Resident from Institute of Medical Science and SUM Hospital, Bhubaneswar, Odisha. Dr. Anwar M. Ahmed, DRNB Registrar, Apollo Hospitals, Hyderabad. And Dr. Rahul Baby Joseph, DRNB Resident, Baby Memorial Hospital, Calicut, Kerala. The format of uh, today's program will be like this. Before that, um, I am planning to post the pre-test for the postgraduates among the audience. So the questions will be on your screen. So today's topic, uh, we'll be dealing in three subtopics, ARDS, definition, epidemiology, pathophysiology. Then second topic, we'll move on to ARDS management, where the uh, second speaker will deal with the ventilatory strategies. And the third lecture will be on adjunctive therapy and supportive care in ARDS management. We'll be doing in uh, such a way that uh, each of the speakers will be given 20 minutes to present their topic. After 15 minutes, they'll get a warning bell, 18 minutes, a second warning bell, so that they can wind up the presentation in 20 minutes. Once their presentation is through, uh, the speaker will take uh, an interactive discussion session with the moderators. I also request uh, the audience to uh, chip in with their, your query and comments through the Zoom chat box. And uh, all those suggestions, the responses will be addressed at the end of the session by uh, the three eminent moderators. I hope the uh, pattern is clear. This is how this session is being planned. Uh, for the pre-test, I think I will give another, say, 20 seconds. There are only four questions. The beauty of this pre-test is the, uh, there will be a post-test questions also. We will discuss how the audience responds to the post-test uh, questions. And uh, we'll see how we could uh, interact and uh, clarify our concepts, the current and evolving concepts on ARDS management. So as of now, I'm winding up the pre-test poll. Okay, so this is the response. So to begin with, I'd like to have some um, uh, opening remarks from the moderators. Divatia, sir, please. Uh, good evening and uh, thank you, Dr. Radhakrishnan, sir, and Dr. Sanish for uh, thinking of this very innovative uh, format involving the PGs uh, and uh, for inviting me to be a part of this. So I think uh, this is going to be a very extreme, interesting uh, session. And going by the results that we've seen on the pre-test, I think uh, there is room for, uh, there is the need for this seminar and there is a room for discussion 
on many of the issues uh, that do occur in the course of a clinical management of an ARDS patient, as well as what you would need to face in your exams and in your vivas. So I congratulate uh, the ICA for this uh, initiative, and I'm very happy to be part of it. And I wish everyone all the best. Thank you very much, sir. Actually, we have done a Telegram group survey also where more than 800 um, responses we got. Uh, there were some of the responses, as we discussed, need uh, more clarification, I think, as sort of the uh, same trend is going on even in this pre-test, maybe even with the audience as well. We'll uh, go along the topic and um, uh, we'll clarify these um, concepts uh, by the end of this session. Dr. Anup. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, again, it's uh, really happy to join all you, uh, all of you, in this uh, uh, good event organized by uh, ICA. Uh, again, uh, the topic is a very important topic, especially in this uh, uh, COVID outbreak scenario also. Uh, and uh, uh, now we have uh, three uh, uh, postgraduate students who are pres presenting uh, different aspects of uh, ARDS. And after that, we can have a discussion also. So please. Uh, uh, make utilize of uh, utilize this uh, session, and we have uh, uh, eminent uh, faculties also here to discuss the topic. So all the best. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shakti Bedanta Mishra. Good evening, everyone, and uh, it's a privilege to keep me as a moderator in this particular program. Thanks for invitation. And uh, I think we will be covering most of the basic topics of ARDS over the three programs and as the pre-test shows we'll definitely have a good discussion ahead thank you okay okay so um, we'll begin the session with uh, dr cherry and roy from uh, institute of medical science and SUM hospital bhubaneswar odisha he'll be enlightening us on the ards definition epidemiology and pathology over to you dr cherry Thank you, sir. So good evening, one and all. First of all, I will introduce myself, myself, Dr. Cherian Roy. I am doing my first year DM residency program in Institute of Medical Science and Sam Hospital, Bhuvaneshwar. Uh, also, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all the coordinators of this ICA academic platform for giving me an opportunity to present uh, in a huge academic platform. And without much delay, I will move on to my topic. So I will be discussing on the topic acute respiratory distress syndrome, the definition epidemiology and pathophysiology. So I will be covering in the aspect of what was the evolution of ARDS from historical perspective, the epidemiology of ARDS from global perspective, understanding the mechanisms of lung endothelial and alveolar epithelial injury, optimal approaches for the diagnosis, screening and early recognition and evaluation of the infectious as well as non-infectious causes. So coming to the first part, it was way before 1967, a lot of case reports actually came when the doctors named them as acute respiratory failure, capillary leak syndrome, shock lung, traumatic wet lung, adult hyaline membrane disease. But it was in 1967, as you can see in this article, there was a case report of 12 patients in which they discovered the clinical presentation in critically ill adult as well as pediatric patients with acute hypoxemia, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, decreased lung compliance, increased work of breathing and need of positive pressure ventilation. So this landmark was actually achieved by Dr. David Ashbok and also Petty in 1967. So after that, what happened was that, so they diagnosed the condition as the different line and they just termed it as acute respiratory distress syndrome. In 1992, there was another consensus that came, that is the American European Consensus Conference, AECC. So they introduced the concept of acute lung injury, ALI, and also ARDS. So they established a specific diagnostic criteria and this article was actually published in the American Journal of Critical Care Medicine in the year 1994, the American European Consensus Conference. 
So what exactly is actually the burden of ARDS? In the pre-COVIDian era, we almost had 4 lakh cases per year, which was associated with high mortality of approximately 27 to 45%. And the most interesting thing is that they found there was significant residual disability was also there. It is very important because after the treatment of ARDS, despite having a return of a normal pulmonary function test, many of the patients were actually having residual poor quality of life index and also they were having multiple residual disabilities. Also. Another important question that we have to answer here is that whether this ARDS is only associated with the patients who are having chronic conditions like old age people who are having chronic lung disease or anything like that. The answer is big no because it can affect in every age group with different different presentations also. So this table actually depicts what happened in 1992 by the American European Consensus Conference, where they brought one timing, oxygenation, chest radiograph, and also interestingly, they brought one pulmonary artery wedge pressure. So main introduction in this uh, AECC concept was they recommended a pulmonary artery wedge pressure of less than or equal to 18 millimeters of mercury, and there should not be any clinical evidence of left atrial hypertension. Similarly, in chest radiograph, bilateral chest infiltrates on the frontal chest radiograph, they classified it into two criteria, that is acute lung injury criteria and acute respiratory distress syndrome criteria. Timing they just give as acute onset and they classified mainly this ALI and ARDS criteria based on PF ratios. So PF ratio, if it was less than 300, they termed it as ALI criteria. PF ratio, if it is less than that of 200 millimeters of mercury, that is ARDS criteria. Here you have to note that in bracket it has been given regardless of the PEEP level. So why it is important, I will come shortly. So a lot of pitfalls happened in the case of this AECC consensus of 1992. So the scientists and also the researchers uh, decided to make some modifications in this definition. And they came with what is known as our current definitions of ARDS, that is the 2012 Berlin's definition of ARDS. So this was published in the JAMA journal 2012. They proposed mainly three mutually exclusive categories of ARDS based on the degree of hypoxemia. So actually they, what they did was that they picked up what all limitations that were actually happening in the AECC conference and they tried to modify it actually. So in the particular category, this table you can see Regarding the timing in AECC definition, it was just mentioned as acute onset, but we don't know what was the meaning exactly what was the acuity, how many days or whatever it was actually there. So by modifying that in Berlin definition, they particularly framed a time specification for that. Similarly, the ALI category, they subdivided it into three particular categories. In the AECC conference, there was only two categories like ALI and also ARDS, while in a Berlin definition, they classified into mild, moderate and also severe category, depending upon the PF ratio and also the requirement of the PEEP. Similarly, oxygenation. In the case of the AECC, as we know that they were regardless of the PEEP, but the significance of PEEP was actually identified in the Berlin definition and they introduced the concept of PEEP and they applied that particular fact into the current definition. Also the chest radiograph. See the importance of chest radiograph is that suppose if I am actually seeing a chest radiograph, it might be looking ARDS for me or it might be looking an interstitial pneumonia for me or it will be looking like a cardiogenic pulmonary edema for me. But for another person, it will be looking entirely different action. So there were a lot of inter-observation variability was actually there. So in order to that, in order to overcome that in Berlin definition, they provided a lot of clinical weaknesses. That, that means they provided at least a lot of images, how almost like, not exactly, but somehow how the ARDS could be identified from the X-ray and also how to proceed with it. One of the most important change that they did in the Berlin definition was they took completely this pulmonary artery wedge pressure component from the AECC definition. See, sometimes what happens is that an example is a patient with that of severe sepsis who is having septic cardiomyopathy who may be having a raised LA pressure. So that particular patient will be having a coexisting the uh, ARDS also. 
so measurement of pawp is first of all is very cumbersome in the current era and the second thing is that they have completely taken off this pawp but the importance is that we have to find out whether the particular worsening of the patient should be because of the pa the increased la pressure that is a cardiogenic hydrostatic edema or it is purely due to the ards factor only and they have also mentioned some of the risk factors that were actually included which triggered the onset of ards so we have evidence for each of these things so this is actually what the original article that was published in intensive care medicine journal what was the impact of positive end expiratory pressure on the definition of ards in this 48 patients in ards diagnosed with acc criteria with peep of because they were not using the peep if using the peep for 6 hours they found that 52 percentage of the people had an improvement of pf ratio of more than 200 at the same time with that same peep if they continued it for 24 hours then again another 10 more percentage had increased pf ratio so that was actually the importance of the positive end expiratory pressure then regarding the inter observation variation this was also fully researched and published that i told that is a inter observer variation to identify whether it is an ards for one person or it will be another for another person also similarly high values of the pulmonary artery wedge pressure in patients with acute lung injury and acute respiratory distress syndrome what they found was that 82 percentage of the patient in the icu had at least one of the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure or pulmonary capillary wedge pressure which was more than that of 18 mm of mercury which was going against the initial definition of the acc so that was the most important reason why the pawp criteria was completely taken off in the current berlin definition now if you are seeing the ards can be classified into mild moderate and also severe if you are asking me what is the most common manifestation of the ards i will tell it will be the moderate form of ards because seeing here the percentage distribution itself moderate um, total accounts for about 50 percentage while mild is 22 and severe is actually 28 this arrow represents that is how much percentage of the mild will be progressing towards a moderate how much will be the moderate progressing towards a severe so about 29 percentage will be progressing from mild to moderate and also from moderate to severe 13 percentage accounts why this is important is that as the severity of the ards is actually in increasing from mild to moderate to severe there was significant increase in mortality from 27 percentage to 45 percentage and the duration of mechanical ventilation from 5 days to 9 days also so what was actually the berlin definition now in the berlin definition as i told the final conclusion was 10 percentage of the patients admitted with respiratory failure according to the berlin's definition out of which 20 percentage of the patients met the ards criteria so this is actually the berlin's definition that is being currently followed which was published in 2012 so they have clearly given a timing that is within one week of a non clinical insult or new or worsening respiratory symptoms so this particular time period is actually required for the diagnosis of ards similarly chest imaging bilateral opacities but it should not be fully explained by effusions lobar or lung collapse or nodules similarly the origin of edema we know i i told some patients may be having cardiogenic pulmonary edema coexisting with the uh, uh, ards also so what the advantage is that in this berlin definition they provided as a facility for to conduct an objective assessment like echocardiography in order to exclude the hydrostatic edema if no risk factor is actually present then depending upon the categorization on the basis of pf ratio and also the p or the cpap they have classified into mild moderate and also the severe so mild is actually a pf ratio between 200 to that of 300 with p if the patient is on invasive mechanical ventilation or if the patient is on non invasive mechanical ventilation the cpap of more than or equal to 5 cm of water moderate is pf ratio between 100 to that of 200 and severe is a pf ratio of less than or equal to that of 100 with a p more than or equal to 5 cm of water now why do we need a particular categorization why we want to uh, define this mild moderate severe as i told in the previous slide there is a moderate form is actually the most severe form or the most common form 
So this is actually a same spectrum of disease, but this is having a different severity, different mortality, and also different treatment modalities are also applicable at each of these stages also. Now, so when we look from the historical perspective, 1967, the case series of Oshback came, then AECC provided the AECC definition in 1992, the pitfalls were collected in the 2012 Berlin definition, and one more modification was done in 2016, that was known as a Kigali modification, which I will come to later a little bit. So now why ARDS diagnosis is actually said to be clinical? So it is not practical to obtain the direct measurements of the lung injury by any of the histopathological examination in most of the patients. And neither the distal space nor the blood samples can be used to diagnose the ARDS. So we have to particularly stick on to this particular Berlin's criteria or the Berlin's definition that was provided in 2012 for the diagnosis of ARDS. Now coming on to the second subtopic that is the epidemiology. So epidemiology, they actually conducted a lot of studies. The first study was actually done in Washington in 21 hospitals from April 99 to July 2000. They assessed uh, a particular validated screening protocol to diagnose. So the PF ratio of less than 300 bilateral chest capacities and non evidence of left heart failure. And this was actually termed as ARDS for them because this was before the Berlin's definition. So on what they found was that annual incidence was 1,90,000 cases per year in US with an in-hospital mortality of 38.5 percentage. So this was an original article that was published. But later on, the famous study came that is the lung safe study. So the advantage of the lung safe study was it provided the challenges in recognizing and diagnosing the ARDS the high prevalence of the ARDS in intensive care units and the shortcomings in applying treatment with the lung protective ventilation also. So the key findings of this original investigation were the prevalence of ARDS in patients in intensive care was 10 percentage, 23 percentage of the ARDS among all the ventilated patients, mortality increases with increased severity of ARDS, Clinical recognition in ARDS was low because they set up certain criteria like how much PEEP was actually required, what was the FIO2 requirement. On the basis of that, the clinical recognition was low, but the most important pitfall was that there was a high mortality that was actually being recognized in this. But this mortality, whether it is attributed to comorbidities or immunocompromise, that was actually not mentioned in this particular study. So for that end, uh, subgroup analysis was actually being done and that was actually being proposed also. So there are a lot of risk factors that put the patients into ARDS. So these all are evidence-based alcohol abuse, cigarette smoking, air pollution, hypoproteinemia, transfusion risk, and also a lot of other risk factors like traumatic ARDS, which was actually studied in the prompt study. That was actually the prospective observation multicentric study and also a lot of other genetic associations were also being studied in the ARDS risk factors. Now, we are classifying the ARDS into two forms, that is a primary ARDS and also the secondary ARDS. Primary ARDS means it is mainly particular to the lung pathology, that is a pulmonary causes of issue pneumonia or aspiration pneumonitis, and secondary ARDS are the extra pulmonary causes that includes the non-pulmonary sepsis like peritoneal, urinary tract and major trauma, burns, etc. But despite of all the causes, we can see that the most common cause for the ARDS is said to be sepsis followed by the pneumonia. Now we will come to the pathophysiology. So in the pathophysiology, we will try to understand what is meant by the type 1 and type 2 alveolar epithelial cells, what is a vectorial ion transport, composition of epithelial endothelial junction, concept of interstitial edema and alveolar edema, concept of arterial hypoxemia and increased pulmonary dead space. Also an article published that clearly produced that increased pulmonary dead space with decreased respiratory compliance produced independent predictors of ARDS mortality also. So this picture says it's all about the pathophysiology. So here what I will just quickly tell, this is the alveolar epithelial cell. Hope my cursor is actually visible for all. So this epithelial uh, alveolar cell, that is actually the alveolar type cell 1 and also alveolar type 2 cells are actually there. So this is the AT1 cell that is a flag cells. This is a cuboidal cells. 
this will be having an epithelial sodium channel and a basolateral sodium potassium atps channel so here three important things we have to uh, remember one is this is a capillary this is the interstitium and this is the alveolar membrane so what happens is that there will be leaky capillaries so that means the fluid and proteins will be leaking from these capillaries traversing into the interstitium then into the alveoli causing the alveolar edema lot of pathophysiologies are actually there but it is very difficult to remember all the molecular pathology like the tight junctions but only one thing that is actually being remembered is that once this tight junctions between the capillary endothelium is being dysfunctional or the epithelial alveolar cells that is the 81 cells or 82 cells are actually being defective it is actually causing the seepage of the uh, uh, fluid and proteins from here to the alveoli causing the interstitial edema and also the alveolar edema so what it happens is that a lot of high, um, inflammatory cytokines will be released forming the seeping of all these things into the alveoli causing the hyaline membrane formation so what is the endotypes and also phenotypes of ARDS? So before this, we were actually seeing what all things were on the basis of the four inflammatory markers, inflammatory interleukin-6, interferon gamma, angiopoietin, etc. So they classified into hyperinflammatory and also hypoinflammatory group. In the hyperinflammatory group, what they found that high PEEP improved the outcome, liberal fluids worsened the mortality. But this is very important because after optimizing the initial fluid resuscitation, if the patient had a hyperinflammatory, that is a cytokine surge is actually there, liberal fluids was worsening the mortality. These groups were associated with high vasopressor, high prevalence of sepsis, mortality and mechanical ventilation and organ failure day all were actually higher. But in hypoinflammatory group, conservative fluid management was said to be harmful also. So pathological phases, just we have, as I told, there are three phases are actually there. Exudative phase, where I told all this characteristic hyaline membrane deposition is a classic hallmark in this, which is characterized by alveolar hemorrhage, accumulation of the polymorphonuclear cells, fibrin deposition, etc. Then forms the proliferative phase where the 82 cell hyperplasia will be happening and some will be actually resolved at that particular stage, while some will be progressing into the chronic or the fibrotic phase. So in the chronic or the fibrotic phase, what happens is that once a fibrosis sets up, a lot of mechanical complications can also happen, like bullet formation, which can lead to even give a high positive pressure leading to pneumothorax, vascular occlusion because of intimal hyperproliferation of the capillary endothelium leading to pulmonary hypotension. So just remember the three terms that is exudative, proliferative and chronic fibrotic phase. So this is the same which I told already, that is how the mechanism is actually causing the endothelial damage and also the epithelial injury and also the repair. So can we predict the ARDS actually? So basically the diagnosis will be determined by the Berlin's definition, but there are some of these scores, that is a lung injury prediction score, LPIS score was actually there. So what they found was that every one unit increase in the lung injury prediction score after uh, a value of a 5.5, it was increasing the ARDS increase by 1.50 percentage. That was actually done in the post-surgical critical patients. Similarly, when I previously told was what the Kigali modification. So we know we require ABG analysis for the total PF ratio calculation in order to classify them into mild, moderate, severe. So suppose if we don't have such particular ABG in all the setups actually, what they did was that almost every timing and origin was actually similar as in Berlin definition. Imaging was also similar, but oxygenation instead of PF ratio, they calculated SpO2 by FiO2 ratio, which was less than 315 with no PEEP requirement, was approximately equal to that of the moderate category of the ARDS. Even though it was actually not categorizing the ARDS into mild, moderate, severe as Berlin, but somehow in resource limited cases, we can trust upon that also. So it is having good sensitivity, but moderate specificity also. Another lot of scoring system also came like uh, the radiographic assessment of lung edema, etc. But the main thing is that we have to stick on to the Berlin's definition for diagnosis also. So in a nutshell, the acute respiratory distress syndrome is a common cause of respiratory failure in critically ill patients characterized by the acute onset, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, hypoxemia, need of mechanical ventilation. It is important to identify, as I told, the primary or the pulmonary ARDS 
secondary extra pulmonary ads and ads mimics like cardiogenic pulmonary edema where we can use the utility of the echocardiography despite some improvements still the mortality remains very high and diffuse alveolar damage and laboratory studies have demonstrated both the alveolar epithelial and also the capillary endothelial injuries and diagnosis is mainly based upon the consensus syndromic criteria despite we have a lot of the um, uh, rail criteria and also lips criteria but we have to modify according to the under resource settings and also in pediatric patients thank you thank you very much uh, dr cherian now it's over to the moderators Uh, Cherian, you have uh, presented the topic uh, very well, uh, including the concept, uh, the pathophysiology, and uh, how uh, the definition was derived, the evidence uh, behind that. All those things was uh, well explained. Uh, very good presentation, really appreciate. Uh, and again, I think uh, all of the uh, listeners also will be knowing about uh, the new Berlin definition, the importance, what are the, the major uh, criteria in that. That is a basic uh, thing in understanding IRDS. And again, we have uh, two types, uh, like even though it's not uh, accepted in this uh, definition, like a no pulmonary ARDS and a non-pulmonary ARDS. And again, with COVID, uh, we again had uh, uh, HL and L types described. Uh, again, uh, uh, the, the Gattinoni uh, types. Uh, that was initially observed, like uh, the one with a normal compliance and one with a reduced compliance. But, uh, Nowadays, as you all know, we are not seeing uh, much cases with a uh, normal compliance. Majority of the patients are having reduced compliance like uh, all other uh, ARDS. Yes. Thanks. So just an additional comment. You know, the definition is, uh, you know, nowadays most people with uh, who come in who are breathless and who come in with acute hypoxic uh, respiratory failure are put on high flow nasal cannula oxygen, you know, many of them. And yes. so although they meet all the other criteria for uh, diagnosis, diagnosing ARDS, mm -hmm. they may not meet that five PEEP criteria, you know, but that, yes. so technically if you're writing a paper, you can't call it ARDS, but otherwise it's for all practical purposes, it is ARDS. So that's why if you see many of the publications, uh, on high flow nasal cannula oxygen, they'll they won't say ARDS. You know, they will say high flow uh, acute hypoxemic uh, respiratory failure. So that's just a technical point that we are making. You know, the, so the catch is that that five peep is included in the definition. So it in, in those days it was you know you are ventilated either by NIV or by intubation, and you had five peep. But now with HFNC, that's a downside. Yes. Dr. Sakti, any, yeah. comments? any questions from the audience? Or um, I request uh, from the audience also, you can um, text in Some, uh, your comments to comment. and query. So, someone um, else want to comment. Okay. Uh, can we unmute the audience? They want to comment something. Uh, I think to, uh, towards the end, we'll uh, unmute them after all three PG presentations. Uh, right now, they can text in. Okay. okay. So, uh, if, uh, from audience, if you want to raise any points, either you can uh, take the help of raise your hands option or text in through the chat. We'll address that. Uh, hi, uh, this is Rajesh. I'm one of the intensives from YZAG. Uh, I'm, I'm junior to Dr. Shakti. Uh, so my my comment, I think maybe it's uh, too early in this uh, whole bunch of ARDS discussion. So there's been a lot of uh, like, you know, further uh, comments or discussion about uh, the definition of ARDS. Again, it came back to the root of, do we actually need a word of ARDS, especially by looking at uh, the COVID uh, pathophysiology and uh, you know, all the criteria to meet ARDS. So there's been a uh, comment or an editorial from Gatnoni who asked, uh, 
do we actually need a definition of uh, ARDS or do we need something like an ARDS uh, as a disease process? Because it's more of a syndromic approach to a disease rather than it's the actual disease process. So any comment <clears throat> on those lines? Like my question is, do we actually need a uh, definition of ARDS? Divati sir would like to comment on. Yeah, so again, it's an interesting thing, you know, because uh, like Dr. Anup was also mentioning, you know, you can get ARDS either from the lung or from outside the lung. And even from the lung, there could be various pathologies that could, uh, so ultimately sort of a, sort of becomes some something like a final, final common pathway of uh, lung injury, right? And uh, it's uh, important to recognize that part at least because, you know, that's when things, you really need to tighten up your game. You know, if you if you're dealing with the pneumonia, all you're going to do initially is give antibiotics, and you know maybe when you start needing a little bit of oxygen, you start getting worried. When the patient starts getting confused and dropping his urine out, to get more worried, and then when something which starts off as a unilateral or a unilobar uh, pneumonia becomes bilateral and uh, florid, you know, then you know your patient is in trouble. Now, whether you want to call it ARDS, you want to call it progressive pneumonia, but this is not progressive pneumonia in the sense it's not that the bug has spread from one lobe to all the other lobes that involved everything. Now, there's a different pathology and pathophysiology going on, as Dr. Cherian nicely explained. So I think it's important to understand that uh, uh, while it starts off as different diseases, right? even COVID can start off as a simple sore throat, right? But ultimately, it uh, can progress to something which is very similar to, which is ARDS. So we need to recognize that when that change and the transition is happening so that our interventions are, if not started, are started. And if they are in beginning to happen, they are tightened up. And, you know, we are act very actively working to prevent uh, lung injury and treat the, prevent further deterioration from hypoxia and uh, so on. And, and they will be able to move the patient to a better location, you know, from the ward to an ICU or a or from one hospital to another hospital, so that your patient is equipped to be in a situation, in a place where this uh, problem can be tackled. Therefore, I think it's important to know what you're dealing with. And it's helpful to have a definition. So if you know the PF ratio is going down, if you know the lung infiltrates are increasing, you know, you, you know that this patient is heading for trouble. I think that's the value. Of, uh... I think in that point, even the PF ratio is also very important, especially like, uh, to know, like as Sarah mentioned, to know the severity, where to keep the patient, whether to uh, escalate the uh, the treatment, all those things are very uh, important. And again, based on the PF ratio, we can again have an uh, like assessment, like which uh, mode of uh, treatment will be better in terms of ventilation, like whether you can continue with HFNC, uh, like uh, can we use NIV, or to how extent we can go with NIV. All those things, I think a PF ratio can also give you uh, a, a, like an idea about the severity of the disease. Yeah, uh, I also agree on that. But uh, actually, the most of the confusion is coming in from the COVID literature and the maybe because in COVID, we started seeing the patient mm -hmm. little more earlier. Uh, the duration was not seven days from the deterioration to the months from the this. Uh, for acute onset, the time period was not fitting into the definition of ARDS. That's why I think maybe we got all these things. And the, also the fact that key, there was also the vascular part and the hyp hypoxia, pathophysiology and other differences which were seen in COVID in terms of the classical ARDS that we have been taught. So there is a, since there was a difference between the pathophysiology, there was this discussion regarding whether we should uh, maybe I think it exists with all the diseases, uh, but ultimately it's the final path of final point where we intervene. That is the thing which we are calling as ARDS. So I don't think we can go away with the definition. Yeah. Okay. And even this L type and H type, I mean, it's, yeah. uh, it has been propagated and proposed by Catanoni, but I don't think there's universal uh, agreement or acceptance of that uh, concept, you know, because uh, at least when patients, uh, 
land up in the ICU requiring some kind of ventilatory support. They are, like Dr. Arup mentioned, mostly veering towards the, you know, the low compliance or the H type, uh, uh, this the uh, ARDS. But uh, the initial ones, the, the ones who require oxygen therapy, you know, who are just requiring oxygen, they may have normal to reasonably compliant lungs, which I suspect you could even have been seeing in your earlier patients of pneumonia, yeah. you know. So all pneumonias don't start off with having uh, stiff lungs. I mean, stiff lungs, exactly. Many pneumonias start off with having reasonably normal lungs, except that one part which is uh, affected. Yeah. Uh, sir, again, Rajesh again. So I agree. Like, okay, we need an uh, definition for ARDS for whatever syndromic approach for ICU sick patient. Uh, like, uh, do we need a better definition of ARDS rather than Berlin? My my implication is uh, like if you ask me like you know what should be the better way of uh, defining ARDS apart from Berlin definitions, um, I would say we can define it better maybe based on the compliance and you know vascular pathology side. But uh, we may not be able to recruit large number of people if you want to study for the studies and ARDS. So it's maybe for the research purpose and simpler definition. Um, and uh, clinically, to manage the patients, do we need a better definition of ARDS? Like, what is your comment on that? Yeah, I think the essence of having a clinical definition, you know, see, they've done away with uh, the need for pulmonary artery catheter measurements. You know, you just need no evidence of, uh, they also recognize you can have a, a heart failure coexisting with ARDS, you know, so it's so just to, it is important to recognize ARDS early. Uh, and to institute the right sort of uh, treatment and lung protection in time. That's why it's a purely clinical definition. It is not, the moment you say you need to start measuring compliance means you need to have the patient intubated. So you cannot uh, talk about it unless the patient is intubated. So the question is you still need to make sure the patient's intubated well, well in time and you're know, picked up and maybe get away with non-invasive stuff, you know? So I think uh, now no definition is perfect and you're done no definition is perfect and there can always be improvements and they keep improving every few years. Uh, but the important thing is that this definition is based on data. It is not something of what five people sat together and thought or what 10 of us here sat and thought it would be a good definition of ARDS, which was what the initial definition was. But you know, it's based on data and it's based on uh, some sort of clinical and pathological sort of uh, things. Uh, and pathophysiology is nice to have in a definition, uh, but you know when you've got a patient at the bedside, you don't know what's the pathology in his lung and what's the vascularity and what's the thrombotic parts and what are the this parts. I mean, you have to basically go on what is the clinical picture. And again, the idea is to aid early recognition, early diagnosis, and early intervention, and appropriate intervention. I think that would be the key. And uh, for example, the Kigali definition is. Uh, the Kigali is a capital of Rwanda, so it's one of those uh, African countries which is resource poor, and uh, they say that they, we don't have blood gases everywhere, so they use the pulse, SpO2 to FiO2 ratio, the pulse oximeter to FiO2 ratio. So that's a modification which is based on the local circumstances and so on. So I think those definitions, modifications can keep happening, but uh, by and large, the principle is it's a non-cardiogenic kind of pulmonary edema, and how we want to... Uh, class uh, now seven days is uh, the earlier definition like Dr. Cherian mentioned was vague on what is acute. Now here they've given a time frame of seven days, but seven days is not sacrosanct, right? Like Dr. Shakti was saying, in COVID you often get the deterioration happening on the eighth, ninth, or tenth day. But it's still acute. It's still part of the same uh, acute illness which started, and the presentation is maybe a little delayed from not not happening on day one, but you know it's happening on day eight or nine or something. But so I mean, so with those sort of things in mind, uh, and yes, COVID has made us think a little bit uh, more, but I don't think it's changed our uh, understanding very drastically about uh, ARDS. Yeah, the, I think there is a question regarding uh, if there is radiological significance and how to predict worsening and uh, early intubation based on radiological evidence. I don't think uh, that is possible, especially like with uh, the COVID uh, scenarios, you, you know that the CT severity score. So I have a patient with C CT severity score 24 out of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 24 out of 25 in the ward. And at the same time, I have a patient with CT severity score of 
14 out of 25 on ventilator. So I don't think it will be, give you a clear cut idea about the management. It can give you a rough idea about how the disease is progressing or like uh, what is the overall uh, lung involvement. It may not uh, predict you the, 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 the clinical picture always. And again, one more point I would like, I wanted to add regarding this acute interstitial pneumonia. So that was also a controversy initially, whether these acute interstitial pneumonia, these AIPs can be included as ARDS or not, because the diffuse alveolar damage, that pathophysiology was well described in interstitial pneumonia. Yeah, so I, I think uh, Dr. Anup has hit the nail on the head. Please don't wait for a certain x-ray picture before you decide to intubate the patient. Please go on clinical sign and I think it will be covered in one of the talks as to what are the criteria to, or when should you consider intubating a patient who is initially being non-invasively or uh, treated, right? And I think um, uh, we'll move, move ahead with the second topic. So uh, rest of the discussion, we'll take it together after uh, our next uh, two postgraduate colleagues are also finishing their topic. So uh, shall I invite uh, Dr. Anwar for the second topic on uh, ventilatory strategies in ARDS management? I thank the organizing committee for this opportunity. So uh, ARDS management, ventilator strategies. So uh, my discussion will be basically based on uh, three, four questions. Like the first question that I want to ask is why do we need a strategy? Why do we, why do we need a ventilatory strategy? So what are the roles of HFNC or NI? How will you initiate the mechanical ventilation? What is your target? What will you target in a patient whom you started on mechanical ventilation? And what if you su succeed? What will you do if you succeed in ventilating the patient successfully? And what if your strategy fails? And what are the rescue strategies? So first question, why do we need a strategy? So advances in acute respiratory distress syndrome diagnosis and therapy have developed steadily over the last 50 years, as uh, Dr. Charyan has discussed. But the mortality has remained static at 30 to 40 percent in the last 10 years, and the disease is quite underdiagnosed. So uh, this is the landmark study, the LexSafe study. It was an observational study which was done in 50 countries in the emergency care units regarding the epidemiology, patterns of care, and mortality for patients with ARDS. So in this study, what they have found out that the clinical recognition of ARDS. Dr. Anwar, sorry to interrupt you. Can you just move closer to your computer or something and speak a little louder? Okay. So the clinical recognition of ARDS, uh, which was ranged from 51.3 percentage in mild ARDS to 78 percentage uh, in severe ARDS. And only less than two thirds of patients with ARDS received a tidal volume of 8 ml per kg or less. And the plateau pressure was measured only in 40% of patients, whereas in 82% of the patients, only 82% of the patients received a positive end expiratory pressure of less than 12 centimeter of water. And despite all the evidences in proning, the prone position was used only in 16.3% of patients with severe ARDS. So definitely we need to have a discussion and an idea about uh, managing the ventilation in ARDS. So the conclusion with LungSafe study was among uh, ICUs in 50 countries, the period prevalence of ARDS was 10.4 percentage of ICU admission. And this syndrome appeared to be underdiagnosed and undertreated and associated with a high mortality rate. So uh, their findings indicated the potential for improvement in the management of patients with ARDS. So first we will discuss the role of HFNC. So uh, once the COVID started, uh, everybody started using HFNC. So is there any uh, real evidence behind using HFNC in patients with ARDS? So uh, the Florali trial, it was a multicenter open label trial, which showed patients without hypercapnia and acute hypoxemic respiratory failure with a PF ratio of less than 300. These patients were given HFNC or standard oxygen and NIV. These three were compared between the patients. And the primary outcome was uh, patient intubated at day 28. And the secondary outcomes were all cause mortality at 90 days and number of ventilator few days at 28 days. In the results, when they looked at the overall population, as you can see, there were no much difference, no statistically significant difference in terms of cumulative incidence of intubation at day 28. But in the analysis of patients who are having PF ratio less than 200, 
definitely the hfnc had a better better survival actually better the cumulative incidence of intubation was lesser in high flow oxygen group compared to nav and standard oxygen therapy group also the 90 day survival was also better in high flow oxygen group so this florally trial uh, gave evidence for the use of uh, high flow nasal oxygen for patients who are having ARDS with a mild to moderate ARDS. So what is the evidence behind using of NIV? So the previous LengthSafe study had a sub-study of LengthSafe study in which uh, 436 patients out of 2,813 patients with ARDS were managed with NIV on day one and two. So when they looked at the mild, moderate and severe ARDS group, the NIV failure was 22, 42 and 47 percentage respectively. And the hospital mortality in NIV failure patients was 45.4 percent. And the NIV was associated with a higher mortality in patients with PF ratio less than 150. So you should be always careful with using NIV in patients who are having moderate to severe ARDS because the mortality is significantly higher in patients whom you use NIV who are having moderate to severe ARDS. So why uh, there is an increased incidence of failure of NIV that we will discuss further on. So this is another study that came out in 2013. This also showed patients who are having moderate to severe ARDS, the survival without intubation was much less. And the predictors of NIV failure include PF ratio less than 150, active cancer, patients with shock, lower GCS, and lower PEEP level at NIV initiation. So when we looked at possible problems with NIV, now the concept of patient self-inflicted lung injury comes. So in a patient who is spontaneously breathing, in severe lung injury, there will be very high transpulmonary pressure. This transpulmonary pressure is the difference between airway pressure and the pleural pressure. I will discuss further regarding transpulmonary pressure later on. So say if a patient, you are keeping an NIV at a positive pressure of 20 and the patient is taking vigorous respiratory effort by developing a very high negative pleural pressure. So the airway pressure will add up to the negative pleural pressure and the patient will develop a very high transpulmonary pressure. So this will cause a patient self-inflicted lung injury, which will cause higher driving pressures, higher cyclical collapse, increasing shear strain, worse the lung injury. And the patient also actively expirates and this promotes the alveolar collapse. So you should always be careful in using NIV in moderate to severe ARDS. So another concept in using HFNC is the ROX index. ROX index is the ratio of saturation or FIO2 to the respiratory rate. So at any point of time, if the ROX index is more than 4.8, it is safe to keep the patient and continue monitoring on HFNs. So if you see this chart, we calculate the ROX at 2 hours, 6 hours, and at 12 hours. At any moment, if the ROX index is more than 4.88, you can continue the monitoring, continue the patient on HFNO. But if the ROX index is uh, less than 2.8, at 2 hours, you should consider intubation. And if it is between 2.8 to 4.8, you need to reevaluate, increase the support. So at six hours, the same thing. If it is less than 3.47, you consider intubation. At 12 hours, if it is less than 3.85, consider endotracheal intubation. Don't wait for the patient to worsen or get tired. So now coming to the mechanical ventilation proper in ARDS. So Dr. Cherian has discussed uh, the injuries that is happening in the lungs uh, while getting an ARDS. So once you look into the CT scan, you can see the pathophysiology of ARDS into the actual picture. So uh, the, the CT scan shows there is pleural effusion, there is a dependent consolidated and collapsed lung, and there is an area with a pulmonary edema. So this area with pulmonary edema actually is the recruitable lung that we can use. And there is a normal lung that is a baby lung. So the normal lung, it is shaded in yellow. So you can see the baby lung is very small. And there is a small area of potentially recruitable lung. And there are uh, areas of pulmonary edema and dependent consolidated and collapsed lung. So in this background, we will go ahead with the tidal volume strategies in ARDS. So in a traditional approach, as we know, uh, we want a good ABG. We were only prioritizing the 
traditional goals of acid based balance and the patient comfort and the lower priority was given to the lung protection but in the lung protective approach we give higher priority to lung protection and the lower priority to the traditional goals of acid based balance and comfort so why do we need a lung protective strategy what will happen if you ventilate a patient with a high tidal volume or a high pressure so the ventilator itself will cause a lung injury that is a ventilator induced lung injury that can be because of over distension causing polytrauma or repeated recruitment and collapse causing atelic trauma or inflammation or high pressure causing barotrauma or the toxic effect of the oxygen and another new concept is the energy trauma because you are pushing air into the lungs of the patient so that is causing an energy trauma and this harm of mechanical ventilation derives from the interaction between the anatomical and physiological characteristics of the lung parenchyma and there is an intro- important concept of stress and the strain the stress is caused by the driving pressure and the transpulmonary pressure which we will discuss and the strain is caused by the volumetric strain the volume you are pushing into the patient's lung that is caused by the tidal volume by frc ratio so the energy that you are using to push air into the patient is shown by the power so the power is directly proportional to the respiratory rate the tidal volume the peak pressures the peep so all these elements will cause a lung injury don't think that only the peak pressure will cause lung injury or the tidal volume will cause lung injury all these components can cause lung injury so you need to optimize all these targets to ventilate a patient without causing lung injury so uh, as dr cherian has discussed there is an injury to the alveolar capillary basement membrane and there is increased permeability there is an alveolar edema which is causing refractory hypoxemia so how will you treat this condition so you need to give positive pressure ventilation because in every case in a pulmonary edema itself also you will give positive pressure ventilation so first aim is to give positive pressure ventilation definitely the second thing we have a baby lung so we can't damage that baby lung so there is only a small area of compliant lung so we need to go lung protective ventilation so third one is there is a loss of surfactant there is dysfunction there is alveolar instability which collapse there are lung complex compliant portions of the lung there is shunt and hypoxemia so here you may have to use recruitment and open lung ventilation so the ventilatory strategies in ards basically you go about positive pressure ventilation lung protection and open lung ventilation recruitment i will discuss further so uh, this is one of the few studies in critical care which showed a mortality benefit the ards net trial which showed uh, ventilation with tried ventilation with lower tidal volume as compared with traditional tidal volumes for ards this was published in 2000 so in a nutshell what uh, the ards trial has done is that they have done volume control ventilation comparing with 6 ml per kilo tidal volume to 12 ml per kilo tidal volume in the 6 ml per kilo group they have kept the plateau pressure below 30 cm of water and in 12 ml per kilo they have kept it below 50 cm of water and in both the group the peep was kept equal to or more than 5 cm of water and the oxygen saturation targets were more than 88 percentage surprisingly in the low tidal volume group they had a lower hospital mortality 31 compared with uh, 31 versus 39 in the high tidal volume group with a number needed to treat of 11 that was quite significant and those patients who were on lower tidal volume had a lower ventilator dependent days and they had a larger number of days free of non pulmonary organ failure so when a patient is being ventilated with a low tidal volume they even had a less number of non pulmonary organ failure or so that was a significantly positive study that changed our practice of ventilating ards patient all together so uh, this is a flow chart mentioning what they have done this is the protocol that has been used by the ards net trial group so first when they recognized one patient as ards they sedated the patient intubated and ventilated so they started the volume control ventilation with a tidal volume 6 ml per kilo of ideal body weight and uh, initially they started with 4 and they have titrated up to 8 ml per kilo initial respiratory rate was 20 with an fio2 of 1 and peep of 5 and after half an hour they did an apg 
and they checked the pH. They checked whether the pH gold was between 7.2 to 7.45. First, they checked whether it is more than 7.45. If so, they have reduced the respiratory rate. And the next step, if the pH is less than 7.45, that is not more than 7.45, then they checked whether it is less than 7.2. If it is not that, then they continued with the same settings. And if there is severe acidosis, that is the pH is less than 7.2, then they have increased the respiratory rate up to 35. Then they checked if the pH is less than 7.2. If so, if still there is acidosis despite increasing the respiratory rate to 35, they tried with bicarb. And even if it is not working, they have increased the tidal volume to 1 ml per kilo allowing the P-plateau to go above 30. And if the pH is less than 7.2, they continue with the same settings. And on each changes, they have measured the plateau pressure and checked whether the plateau pressure is less than or equal to 30. If it is not less than or equal to 30, they have checked the pH. And so the, if the pH is less than 7.15, if the pH is very severe, acidotic, they have allowed the plateau to go up. If it is not so, then they have checked whether the tidal volume is more than or equal to 6 ml per kilo. If so, they have reduced the tidal volume. So this is in the nutshell what they have done in the ARDS net trial. And uh, to measure the plateau pressure, they did an inspiratory hold and they did three readings each time and allowing more than six breaths between each and took the average of all the three readings. And uh, they did the same thing over each one to five minutes. So how will you initiate the mechanical ventilation? First, you need to calculate the predicted body weight. In males, this is a 50 plus 2.3 into height in inches minus 60. And in female, it is 45.5. And then they set the mode of ventilation to volume assist control mode. Initial tidal volume of 6 ml per kilo. And then the respiratory rate less than or equal to 35 breaths per minute to watch the baseline minute ventilation. Then uh, they have applied an inspiratory pose just to see if the pre-plateau is uh, less than 30. If it is more than 30, they reduce the tidal volume to 1 ml per kilo or uh, up to 5 or up to 4 ml per kilo predicted body weight. And if the pre-plateau is less than 25 and the tidal volume is less than 6 ml per kilo, you can increase the tidal volume by 1 ml per kilo up undo a plateau pressure of more than 25 centimeter of water for the tidal volume of 6 ml per kilo. And if there is breath stocking or severe dyspnea, you can increase it up to 7 or 8 ml per kilo, provided if the plateau remains less than 30 cm of water. And they used a particular PEEP table with an FiO2 and PEEP. This PEEP table is used to titrate the PEEP, and that was based on observation done in the trial. The goals of therapy were PO2 between 55 to 80, the saturation between 88 to 95, and uh, in certain conditions like pregnancy, they have increased the saturation goals. And the plateau pressure goal less than 30. Arterial pH goal uh, 7.3 to 7.45 to prevent ventilator induced lung injury. And surprisingly, there was no PCO2 goal. So as for uh, ARDS net ventilation protocol, there is no PCO2 goal in patients. So uh, how will you titrate the PEEP? So either you can use the ARDS net PEEP titration chart or there is another concept of pressure volume curve. Here you can see the upper and the lower inflection points. You should keep the PEEP 2 to 3 cm above the lower inflection point and uh, the plateau pressure and the tidal volume should be kept below the upper inflection point. This is more theoretical discussion. Or else you can use the compliance method. So you can measure the static compliance as tidal volume divided by plateau pressure minus set PEEP plus uh, auto PEEP. That is the tidal volume divided by the driving pressure. So the, the calculate the best static compliance and you can keep apply the PEEP according to that. I will discuss it in a pictorial way at home. Or else you can calculate the stress index. So uh, in a flow time scalar, you, need a, you keep a square flow and then you look at the pressure time graph and uh, you look at the morphology. If it is concave downwards, there is a potential for recruitment in the first picture. And if it is uh, cone wave upwards, there is over distension. So you need to decrease the PEEP. And another study which was published uh, later on, which they tried the PEEP which was gated by the esophageal pressure monitoring 
or the regular ARDS net uh, chart based beep titration, there was no significant difference between the beep that was titrated based on the esophageal pressure or based on the pressure titration chart. So uh, basically, we can definitely use the PEEP titration chart to titrate the PEEP rather than going with uh, esophageal pressure or driving pressure based on uh, PEEP setting. So high PEEP versus low PEEP. This was addressed by multiple studies, but there is no evidence that a high PEEP strategy is beneficial when applied to unselected patients. In certain subgroup of patients, the PEEP may be helpful, but there is no easy clinical way to identify PEEP responders. So this anatomical recruitment benefits may be countered by the increase in barotrome. So next comes the two important concepts like uh, I wanted to discuss regarding driving pressure and the transpulmonary pressure. So this was a, a study which was done by Amato et al. It was a retrospective observational study of nine randomized controlled trials. So they, uh, they looked at the driving pressure and survival in acute respiratory distress syndrome. So driving pressure is the driving pressure that we calculate by tidal volume by the compliance. So when we look at the plateau pressure, it is the ratio between tidal volume divided by compliance plus PEEP. So in this, if you rearrange it, the plateau pressure minus PEEP will give the driving pressure. That is the ratio of tidal volume by compliance. So in this, uh, the observation done by Amato et al, if you look into it, in the first, they have kept the PEEP at constant and they have increased the tidal volume, which will lead to increase in the driving pressure. So the PEEP, PEEP remains static and that plateau pressure increased and the driving pressure went up. And it, below, if you see that mortality increased. So in the second thing, they have kept, increased the PEEP, but they kept the driving pressure constant. But despite that, there were no mortality benefit. In the third thing, resampling, you can see they have increased the PEEP. Along with that, they have reduced the driving pressure. So there was a significant mortality reduction. So in this, what we infer is that the mortality associated with driving pressure and not with the PEEP. Increasing driving pressure with fixed PEEP leads to higher mortality. Increasing PEEP with fixed driving pressure has no effect on mortality. When increasing PEEP leads to decrease in driving pressure, there is a survival benefit and mortality difference associated with difference in driving pressure and the significant increase in mortality once the driving pressure is more than 40. So uh, here, what I, we have discussed earlier, when you keep increase the PEEP, you see the driving pressure. Once you increase the PEEP, if there is no increase in the driving pressure, you can increase the PEEP to a higher level. But when you increase the PEEP, there is an increase in driving pressure, that means you are overinflating. So then you need to come down on the PEEP. Next comes the transpulmonary pressure. The transpulmonary pressure is the pressure, it's a difference between plateau pressure minus the pleural pressure. And uh, we can take esophageal pressure as a surrogate of pleural pressure. And we can uh, have, uh, we can have things to measure this uh, esophageal pressure. So once you measure the transpulmonary pressure as the difference between alveolar pressure minus the esophageal pressure, you can get the transpulmonary pressure. So aim to keep it at less than 25 centimeter of water at end inspiration and between 5 to 10 at end expiration. Our idea is to minimize the tidal transpulmonary pressure ventilation to less than 15 centimeter of water. So uh, we have done uh, ARDS net ventilation. We have done uh, tidal volume ventilation, low tidal volume ventilation, leg protective ventilation. So now the patient is improving. So we have succeeded in successfully ventilating this patient. So what will you do? So you have to wean the patient from ventilation. For that, we need to conduct a spontaneous breathing trial when the FiO2 and the PEEP is acceptable and the patient is hemodynamically stable with FiO2 of less than 0.4 and PEEP of less than 8 or 0.5 and PEEP of less than 5. And the patient has acceptable spontaneous breathing effort and the BP is normal more than 90 millimeter of mercury without support and no neuromuscular blocking agents. If, it's a, if the patient is in this situation, you can give a spontaneous breathing trial. And uh, for uh, it has been for this, uh, if the patient is stable for at least all of us, initiate a, up to 120 minutes of spontaneous breathing trial with an FiO2 less than or equal to 0.5 with a PEEP of less than 5. 
either with a T piece or a CPAP of less than or equal to five centimeter pressure support of less than or equal to five. And you need to have a, assess the tolerance for the patients for up to two hours. The saturation more than 90, PO2 more than 60. Ventilation, spontaneous ventilatory effort with a tidal volume more than four ml per kilo. Respiratory rate less than 7.35, pH more than 7.3 with no respiratory distress like uh, marked accessory muscle use, abdominal paradox, diaphoresis, marked dyspnea. And if tolerated for at least 30 minutes, you can consider intubation, extubation. If not tolerated, you need to resume the pre-weaning settings. So uh, next thing, what if you are not able to ventilate the patient properly or if you are not succeeding, will you go ahead with recruitment strategies? So this ART trial, which uh, looked into the effect of lung recruitment and titrated positive end expiratory pressure versus low PEEP and mortality in patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome. It was a multicenter RCT with 120 ICUs from nine countries. So they tried, uh, they looked into the effect of lung recruitment strategies. Uh, in the recruitment group, they did decremental PEEP and in the optimal PEEP group, they had used the optimal PEEP method. So in the results, the primary outcome was 28-day mortality, which was higher in the PEEP recruitment with high PEEP group. Even uh, bad outcomes, length of stay, number of ventilators, three days, all were bad in recruitment maneuvers with high PEEP group. And the barotrauma was also statistically significantly high in high PEEP with recruitment group. So recruitment will cause more harm than good to the patients. That is what the outcome they have done. So uh, another thing is the APRV. This is another open lung approach uh, in which the patient is keeping at two spontaneous uh, CPAP levels. Higher CPAP is the baseline pressure and we will give intermittent brief release to a lower CPAP level and spontaneous breathing is allowed at the upper CPAP level. So there are very scarce evidences for that. In, the, in this flow chart, if you see, all the initial studies were before the low tidal volume ventilation, so we can't predict on that. And the 2004 study, which was done uh, after the ARDS net low tidal volume study, they have compared APRV with SIMV pressure support. There was no difference in terms of gas exchange, sedation, or ventilator free days. So this was the recent study I could found in uh, internet, but I don't know about the validity of the study. It was done in 138 patients in which they tried uh, airway pressure release ventilation versus ARDS net low tidal volume ventilation, ventilator free days, a successful extubation, tracheostomy, and the mortality all were significantly better in airway pressure release ventilation group. But this was a single center study, uh, so I don't know about the external validity. Maybe the panelist will be able to answer this. And uh, finally, coming to how much oxygen. So will you go with a lower oxygen target or a higher oxygen target? We had three studies, ICU rocks, a loco trial, and hot ICU trial. There were no significant difference in terms of uh, ventilator free days or 28 day mortality or 180 day mortality in ICU rock study. And in the loco trial, conservative versus uh, liberal strategy, there was trend towards higher mortality and more mesenteric ischemia in conservative oxygen group. And in hot ICU, there were no difference in mortality at 90 days. So uh, coming to high frequency oscillatory ventilation, we had two trials, randomized control trial, early HFNC versus uh, does not help may cause harm. So the OCD trial, uh, the 47 percentage in the HFOV group died in hospital versus 35. And OSCAR group, uh, they had a similar identical result with approximately 41 percentage 30 day mortality in both the groups. And the odds ratio for survival in the conventional group was better. So we need further RCTs. But in both these trials, they used uh, HFOV initially, but you can use it as a rescue strategy if you have the expertise and the machine. I will we'll need further evidence to suggest that. So, uh, and further ventilatory management include the muscle relaxants or uh, other strategies. Uh, the next speaker will uh, discuss it upon. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you, Dr. Anwar, for that. Uh comprehensive overview of the conventional ventilation strategies during uh, in patients with ARDS. So I think you've covered a lot of ground, starting with uh, HFNC and non-invasive support and going on up to uh, uh, invasive uh, mechanical ventilation and how to use PEEP and so on. 
so while we wait for questions the only other thing i think we need to mention why is that prone positioning is now very much part of standard mechanical ventilation in patients with ARDS. You know, earlier we used to say it is for refractory hypoxia or in patients with uh, severe ARDS, but now I think, uh, especially after the ProSIVA study, uh, if the PF ratio goes around 150 is the time we should actually start turning the patients prone and keep them prone for at least 16 hours in a day, uh, you know, and maybe three, four and five uh, sessions of proning may be required. And again, as far as experience in COVID, not only in intubated patients, but even awake patients, we are uh, making prone and ventilating them. So uh, I think that's a very important uh, sort of uh, step in ventilating patients uh, with ARDS, right? Uh, I think there are other aspects like he mentioned, which will be covered by the next speaker, including uh, sedation, neuromuscular blockade, nitric oxide, and uh, you know the including ECMO and so on. So we won't take questions on those topics or any other questions related to conventional mechanical ventilation. Uh, uh, sir, I can... had one doubt regarding this uh, APRD. Because, uh, that trial which showed significant positive effects with uh, APRD, yeah. even though that is a single center trial. Yeah, so, you know, APRD is a... Theoretically, it's a very good mode. It's a lung protective mode and uh, so on. But uh, there are two or three problems. One is, you know, if you people have done the, you know, electron or sort of photomicrographs of alveoli, subpleural alveoli in patients with APRV. And during that period of uh, drop in the pressure, there is actually significant alveolar collapse. And then there is, again, recruitment back. So there is, there may be some more lung injury with APRV as say compared to other methods, okay. Uh, the other thing is, I have not used APRV much myself. In fact, every time we tried to use APRV, it used to feel very uncomfortable to see patients that are, their chest would be bloated up for five, six seconds and it would go down and then zoop, it would come up. You know, those pictures that you, the graph that you showed, when you see a patient is actually quite dramatic and the patient has to be breathing spontaneously to allow sufficient CO2 elimination. So, uh, we were not, I was never very comfortable when handling uh, patients on APR. So I don't really have much uh, experience with that mode. And maybe if uh, Dr. Anup or Dr. Shakti have some experience, they can tell us about it. But otherwise, you know, I don't, uh, and that's just, just the one trial. And most trials of APRV are a little muddled in the sense that some, the standard BiPAP is also called APRV. Whether inverse ratio, it's not so much of an inverse uh, ratio. APR is got a very strong inverse ratio, you know, 4 is to 1, 6 is to 1, 8 is to 1. And some of them have not used those sort of things. So, but that trial is a study, but it's only one study. And I don't think it's been replicated by anyone else. Yeah. So I'm not very sure uh, whether I would really focus so much on APRV. In this. Thanks. Right, Prakash, the same uh, opinion. Uh, I don't think this APRV is going to make it huge uh, difference as Sarah has already mentioned. Whichever mode you use, like you should be uh, uh, expert in using that mode. And again, uh, like whether you use uh, like APRV, uh, the pressure control, volume control, I don't think it's not, go not going to make a huge difference. So the way you uh, adjust with all other settings, that is, a, that is going to make the difference. I also agree on regarding APRV. I personally have never really used APRV, even theoretically speaking, uh, the concept of spontaneously breathing these patients is slightly awkward to me. So we tend to paralyze initially. So uh, I have personally never used, I don't even theoretically also, it does seem that there will be a increased uh, chance of lung injury, especially as Sir said during that uh, gap period when we are allowing some time for that air to come out. Yeah. So any questions from the audience on this topic? I think the only uh, query in the chat was regarding APRV. APRV. So <laughs> I think again, there is this uh, profound interest somehow in APRV, but I am not sure it's a very clinically applicable kind of uh, thing, at least in our hands as of now. Okay. Uh, so I think the bottom line is Dr. Anup, I think very nicely put it, it's not the mode. It is, you know, for example, the 
uh, you know, Dr. Anwar mentioned his presentation. It's the one few studies, positive studies in critical care is the ARDS net trial. And the mode that they used in that trial was volume control assist, assist control mode. You know, the simplest mode. So, in fact, a simple mode which everyone can use, everyone can understand, and everyone is familiar with makes a lot of sense to use, but use it properly with the right ventilatory strategy. So, the strategy is probably more important than the mode. And I think the elements of that strategy are to protect the lung, low tidal volume, and low plateau pressure, appropriate amount of PEEP, whichever you want to add it, as per that. Uh, the simplest again is that uh, ERDS net uh, PEEP to FIO2 uh, table. Uh, Prone positioning whenever uh, required, and uh, you know, uh, uh, good attention to your basics of preventing infection and uh, that kind of thing. And so, recruitment maneuvers only if you have uh, once in a while, if you are seriously hypoxic or something happens, then you can consider recruitment. Like Dr. Anwar mentioned in that art trial, routine use of recruitment maneuvers and high peep is probably not uh, beneficial and may in fact be harmful, right? And uh, so just protect the lung, low tidal volume. Low tidal volume is four to six ml per kilo of predicted body weight, not actual body weight, because today I'm whatever I'm weighing, if I put on another 30, 40 kilos, my lung size is going to remain the same. So you basically stick to your predicted or your ideal body weight. And uh, low plateau pressure is extremely important. And all the other things of ventilation, also, you should do well. And remember, you have to looking for safe blood gas values. You're not looking for normal blood gas values. So you a saturation of 88 to 94 percent is adequate. And unless the person is pregnant or has severe brain injury or something like that. Right. So otherwise, a target saturation is not 98 percent, it's 88 to 94 percent, or your PO2 is about 55 to 75 or 80 or something. A high CO2 is acceptable. Even if you're giving low tidal volume ventilation, provide the patients are reasonably stable and uh, that sort of thing. Right. So, uh, yeah, now someone's mentioned uh, recruitment maneuvers. Uh, yeah, so that knows how to give. And I, I think the one which he described uh, is quite good. It's a sort of stepwise recruitment. But again, don't focus so much on recruitment maneuvers, uh, something you're going to use occasionally. And, you know, but Make sure you get your most of your ventilation done. Someone's talking of 40 people for 40 seconds. So, you know, to give up so that 20, 40 by 40 menu, it was called earlier, 40 CPAP for 40 seconds to keep a patient who's got severe ARDS, who's hypoxic, to keep him for 40 seconds without any ventilation. You know, you try doing that. You know, the, it's quite difficult to for the for the patient very un uncomfortable patient you may see the saturation dropping during those 40 seconds you may expand the lung subsequently but you know for those 40 seconds it's not very easy so the stepwise pressure pressure control and peep improve uh, recruitment maneuver which is described in the art trial is probably the way to go but again it's not a priority issue as far as uh, ARDS management is concerned okay and I think uh, now we'll proceed to the topic three also. Yeah, so prone, one last question, prone positioning, AR, PF ratio in ARDS hits 150, you should prone the patient. Don't wait for severe hypoxia or des as a desperate measure. It should be part of your routine ventilatory strategy. Okay, I think we'll move on to the next uh, topic. Okay, I think um, uh, Dr. Cherian and Dr. Anwar did a very nice job concisely presenting their topic. Now I invite uh, Dr. Rahul, Dr. Rahul Baby Joseph, DRNB resident, Baby Memorial Hospital, Calicut, Kerala, uh, to present the third topic, which is um, adjunctive therapy and supportive care in ARDS management. Over to Dr. Rahul. Thank you. Sir. Good evening to all. Uh, my topic for today is uh, adjunctive and supportive treatment that we use for an ARDS patient. This is I'll be dealing with a brief overview of the various therapeutic interventions and the evidence is supporting or against these methods. So starting with the uh, use of neuromuscular blocking agents, uh, basically in a patient who is ventilated in the initial phase of severe ARDS patients, who we may require to use high PEEP or a low tidal volume ventilation, uh, they may have a lot of uh, patient ventilator asynchrony. So use of neuromuscular blockers in the early stage can improve the patient tolerance to positive pressure ventilation. Now, other methods like uh, it can reduce the systemic and lung inflammation 
there'll be reduction in the oxygen consumption by the say, respiratory muscles all these are proposed mechanisms by which uh, neuromuscular blocking agents uh, are used in safe uh, ventilation in ards so the major uh, evidence uh, regarding this is one is the accuracy trial that came in 2010 and the rose trial in 2019 so the accuracy trial is a multi center rct uh, they compared a neuromuscular blocking agent which was cisatracurium for the first 48 hours they gave a bolus and it was followed by an infusion and it was compared to a placebo and all patients in both the groups were ventilated by the same arma protocol so uh, they found that uh, there was a significant mortality benefit in the patients who were treated with cisatracurium that is the adjusted 90 day mortality was much better in cisatracurium and there was increased number of ventilator free days also so uh, one possible complication that we expect by use of uh, neuromuscular blockers is increase in neuromyopathy or icecoid weakness which was not found to be significantly different in both the groups Uh, another thing is cisatracurium has also anti-inflammatory and anti-oxidant uh, properties. So whether it is because of the paralytic effect or the anti-inflammatory effect is not uh, evident. So you cannot extrapolate these findings to other neuromuscular agents. Mm -hmm. Then nine years later, the Rose trial came, which was again almost the same methodology. They compared cisatracurium for the first 48 hours and versus uh, lighter sedation targets. Uh, in their outcome there was no uh, mortality benefit between both the groups and one thing was that uh, they, they did not have a standardized protocol for ventilating the patient so some patients were used very less optimal peep some patients were not prone ventilated so this uh, might have affected the outcome in these patients and again icu acquired weakness was not found to be different in both the groups so when there is a contradicting evidence so uh, this is uh, algorithm uh, by the icm rpg algorithm so uh, any no, neuromuscular blockers need not be used in all patients who are ventilated with ards so basically mild ards patients or moderate or severe ards patients who can attain lung protective ventilation with uh, light or deep sedation they need not be used uh, they need not be uh, started on neuromuscular agents uh any patient who is having asynchrony with ventilation despite deep and deep sedation these patients may have uh, may need a uh, neuromuscular blocking agents for up to the first 48 hours so another modality what we usually talk about in uh, among the sq therapies in ards is uh, hfov or high frequency oscillatory ventilation as you can see from the pressure volume loop here Uh, during an inflation and deflation cycle there is always a risk of atelectasis and there is always a risk of over distension uh, after a particular volume so the goal of ventilation here is to maintain the alveoli uh, at the safe window so that you can reduce the atelector trauma and improve the gas exchange during a controlled ventilation there are wide swings between these two that's why we almost we always go for a higher peep and a lower dial volume ventilation in hfov the entire cycle actually operates in the safe window okay uh, so theoretically there is a advantage of uh, maintaining a, uh, a stable or a constant mean airway pressure so that there is better recruitment and lower tidal volume is delivered so chance of over distension is also reduced so two major trials that we have uh, for hfov was the oscillate trial as uh, already mentioned and the oscar trial oscillate was a multi center rct in in five countries they compared hfov with conventional lung protective ventilation and it was found that there was significant increase in mortality in patients who were managed with hfov and the trial had to be stopped early because of this increased mortality also hfov required a more sedation neuromuscular blockers and vasoactive agents uh, in uh, in this study then uh, on the same year oscar trial was uh, published which is a uk based study almost the same methodology and here there was no significant difference in the mortality but also showed uh, improvement in the oxygenation in the hfov group because of the uh, lot because of the lot of side effects and the need for neuromuscular blocking agents and vasoactive agents it is not uh, presently recommended for routine care in ards another rescue therapy what we uh, use is probably ecmo uh, which is a extra corporeal membrane oxygenation basically uh, there is a dissociation between mechanical ventilation and gas exchange you can give adequate rest to the lung reducing the ventilator associated lung injury so uh, there are different modalities of ecmo and not going into detail vv ecmo or vv ecmo depending on the patient's hemodynamic status you can go for uh, a particular 
method. So indications of uh, ECMO in ARDS, but uh, potentially it has to be a reversible cause. And duration of mechanis mechanical ventilation ideally should be less than five to seven days. If it is seven to 10 days, she should have been ventilated only uh, less than seven days with high pressures. Pulmonary compliance less than 0.5 ml per centimeter water per kg. PF ratio less than 100 in spite of standard and rescue therapies in severe ARDS and shunt fraction more than 30%. So uh, there was a trial called the CESAR trial in 2009. They uh, tried to look at the safety and efficacy uh, and the cost effectiveness of uh, ECMO in patients with severe ARDS. And they found that if ECMO was a valid treatment option for these patients. And they recommend transferring these patients to an ECMO based management center whenever possible. So uh, EOLIA trial, it was published in 2018. This is uh, the largest uh, trial or evidence we have uh, with regard to ECMO as of now. And uh, they compared early initiation ECMO compared to the standard care or the conventional mechanical ventilation in severe ARDS. Although the primary uh, endpoint, which was mortality at 60 days was not significantly different. There was a uh, number of treatment failures was lesser in ECMO group. So, uh, and also coming to the adverse effects, there was significantly increase in more bleeding manifestations and uh, severe thrombocytopenia in patients in the ECMO group. Extracorporeal carbon dioxide removal, it is a uh, method similar to ECMO, where they use uh, uh, smaller cannulas and a slow, uh, low blood flow or low flow rates without significant effect on the oxidation. This is basically for removal of carbon dioxide to uh, allow for at ultra protective uh, ventilation strategies uh, using uh, like very low tidal volume and very low minute ventilation. So uh, there are two studies basically, the supernova trial that was released in 2019, sorry. Uh, they found that ECOR can be used for facilitating ultra, lung, ultra low tidal volume ventilation in moderate ARDS. Again, incidents with these uh, extracorporeal methods were incidents of adverse effects were significantly higher. Uh, this was the latest study, like uh, it was released in August 2021. Again, uh, it is a large, it was started off as a very large multi-center RCT, around 7,000 patients were screened, but only 6% of these were recruited in the study. So uh, because of futility and feasibility issues, they, uh, it was uh, terminated early. And as per the uh, data that we have, there was no mortality benefit with the use of uh, ECOR. And due to safety concerns, you, you're not, it is not recommended as a standard of care. Another probable uh, experimental therapy that we use is inhaled vasodilators, either nitric oxide or prostacycline. Nitric oxide, as you know, it is a potent endogenous vasodilator, uh, can be given as inhalation. It has a very short T half. It relaxes the uh, vascular and bron bronchial smooth muscles. So many studies have uh, failed to find any survival benefit. It causes an improvement in the oxygenation, a transient improvement in the oxygenation, which uh, may be beneficial if it is used as a bridge to an ECMO. So the mechanism of an inhaled vasodilator is that when, whenever uh, you apply a vasodilator uh, uh, via uh, inhalation, it goes only to the well-ventilated uh, alveoli, and uh, nitric oxide diffuses very quickly into the pulmonary vasculature and causes a decrease in the pulmonary vascular resistance. So this can improve, uh, uh, there is a selective pulmonary vasodilatation and this can improve uh, improvement in the ventilation perfusion mismatch and also decreases a shunt. So uh, there is always a risk of opening poorly ventilated alveoli and increasing the shunt. It is an expensive modality. You need uh, sophisticated equipment. And a prolonged exposure can lead to methemoglobinemia. Tracheal gas encephalation, uh, it is not very uh, significant or useful in a patient with ARDS. This is basically just to wash out the carbon dioxide rich gas from the trachea, reducing the anatomical dead space. There are several uh, uh, side effects that is you can result in oxygen toxicity. It can be a hemodynamic compromise because of water peeping or barotrauma, and also in increased incidence of uh, ventilator-induced lung injury. Use of glucocorticoids ha has, uh, has been a very controversial topic in ARDS. Uh, in the initial studies, uh, which was done in influenza patients, it was found to be uh, associated with increased risk of mortality. The benefit of glucocorticoids is uh, mainly in the proliferative phase, where it can reduce the formation of the fibrosis. So around seven to 14 days, it may be beneficial. And other concerns associated with the use of glucocorticoids have also 
uh, uh, been against the use of uh, routine use of steroids in these patients. So, uh, first trial we'll discuss is the Meduri trial in 1998. This is a very small uh, trial uh, in 24 patients with prolonged uh, or unresolving ARDS patients. So they found that there was a reduction in mortality with the use of steroids, uh, methylprednisolone uh, 2 mg per kg. And there was also a reduction in the oxygen requirement because it was a very uh, small sample size that was not a well-validated study. So uh, the ArtsNet group had a steroid-based uh, study, which uh, they uh, looked for the efficacy and safety of steroids in uh, persistent ARDS. Persistent ARDS means ARDS, which is lasting for more than seven days. Again, uh, they did not find any uh, difference in mortality, but uh, there were increased death rate in those uh, patients treated with steroids after two weeks, that is after 14 days of in, uh, illness. So this is relatively a newer study called the dexa ARD study. This is a large multi-center study which uh, compared dexamethasone uh, versus conventional uh, uh, treatment. Um, so it was uh, found that there was a significant mortality benefit and increased ventilator free days in the group uh, treated with dexamethasone. And also like uh, side effects like hyperglycemia, new onset infections were not found to be different in both the groups. So this is a good study, but not a practice changing trial. And after the COVID uh, era started, there were multiple trials with regard to use of uh, steroids in uh, COVID ARDS. So, so the one is a recovery trial and the remap cap trial. Both basically studied the uh, effect of either uh, dexamethasone or other steroids in the treatment of ARDS induced by COVID. So it was found that in mechanically ventilated patients or those requiring oxygen therapy found to be beneficial in these kind of patients and it may cause harm in patients without hypoxia. So there is a lot of evidence uh, in both benefit and harm with regard to steroid. So you have to go for an uh, individualized approach in these patients. So you look for the uh, indication for steroid, look for the complications and then decide uh, like patient to patient. Coming to fluid management, uh, as mentioned already, there is uh, uh, in ARDS, there is leaky capillaries. So there is uh, protein rich fluid entering the interstitium and alveoli. So this reduces the colloidal osmotic pressure and any increase in the hydrostatic pressure at that point uh, puts the patient at risk of pulmonary edema. So that further uh, worsens the lung mechanics. So conservative fluid strategies have been uh, advocated in patients with uh, early ARDS who are not in shock. One trial supporting this uh, 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 is the FACT trial, which compared conservative versus the liberal fluid strategy. It was by the ArtsNet group. There was no difference in primary outcome, that is the 60-day mortality, but uh, it was found to have increased oxygenation index, lung injury scores, and number of ventilator free days in uh, patients treated with conservative fluid therapy. So coming to the hemodynamic effects, the uh, positive pressure ventilation can cause multiple hemodynamic uh, uh, effects in a patient uh, with uh, ARDS, especially because the pressures are high. Uh, it can lead to increase in pleural pressures and intrathoracic pressure, which reduces the venous return and further decreases the RV afterload and also increases the pulmonary vascular resistance, leading to increase in RV preload, uh, uh, afterload. Sorry. Uh, effectively, they might result in a uh, decrease in the cardiac output. So uh, in a patient uh, with shock, especially ARDS patients who are ventilated, you always look for RV dysfunction and other causes of uh, hypotension like uh, like vasoplegic shock in sepsis, etc. So different modalities of uh, hemodynamic monitoring may be required in these patients. I'm not going into detail, but uh, uh, depending on the patient and institution protocol, I think you can use. Coming to uh, nutritional supports, uh, uh, ARDS is actually a very uh, intensely catabolic state. And nutrition, adequate nutrition and adequate uh, energy requirement is beneficial in these patients, especially enteral root. It helps to modulate metabolic response to stress and also promotes uh, beneficial immune responses. So there is no optimal approach uh, to nutrition in ARDS, but more evidence is required at this area. So another added advantage of uh, using enteral nutrition is that it main maintains the gut integrity and prevents bacterial translocation and secondary sepsis. There is also decreased incidence of ileus, decreased incidence of stress ulceration, and also acalculus cholecystitis in these patients. 
So glycemic control in a patient with ARDS because of stress response and also in if the patient is uh, started on steroids, there is a chance of uh, uncontrolled hyperglycemia. So our, our goal should be to minimize the glucose load to, to maintain a target of 140 to 180 milligram per the deciliter as per the nice sugar trial uh, with use of insulin therapy and measures to uh, avoid hyperglycemia. Uh, infection control, uh, primarily the inciting event that is which might have caused uh, the ARDS like pneumonia or any other site specific insect infections should be treated with appropriate antibiotics. There is always a risk of uh, secondary infection in these patients. So tube and catheter care is uh, mandatory and you can use uh, make use of care bundles like uh, ventilator associated pneumonia VAP bundle or a CRBSA bundle. Uh, always uh, plan for judicial use of antibiotics. Any infection in a patient with severe ARDS definitely will uh, result in a poorer outcome in these patients. So coming to sedation and pain management, pain management is very important in a patient who is mechanically ventilated, especially starting from uh, uh, endotracheal intubation to positioning to vascular access, everything can cause pain and this can lead to uh, increase in the stress response. Stress response along with uh, uh, increased myocardial uh, oxygen demand and uh, they can be a ventilator patient dyssynchrony, aggravating the pulmonary dysfunction. So I always address the precipitating causes of pain, try to reverse it and uh, use uh, analgesia as required for patients, primarily opioids or dexmedetomidine or any other choice as per uh, requirement. And always all patients with uh, critically Ill, Ill patients who are mechanically ventilated on prolonged mechanical ventilation require a GA prophylaxis and also a DVT prophylaxis. So this is just to uh, give an idea of all the uh, like rescue strategies what we have already discussed. ECMO, ECOR, high frequency uh, oscillatory ventilation, inhaled nitric oxide or use of neuromuscular blockers, all should be uh, like uh, preserved for patients who do not respond to low tidal volume ventilation or um, uh, manuals like prone ventilation in severe DIADS patients. To, to summarize, uh, with regard to use of neuromuscular blockers, from the evidence, we, it may be considered in patients with severe ARDS who do not respond to uh, deep sedation or uh, who, do not, uh, who per, continues to have a ventilator patient asynchrony or dyssynchrony in, in spite of sedation. So preferred agent is uh, cisatraquarium because that's the evidence that we have. High frequency oscillatory ventilation is not recommended because it, although it might improve the oxygenation, uh, there are a lot of um, side effects or uh, adverse effects associated with it. PV ECMO may be considered in a patient uh, with severe ARDS uh, who is not responding to a lung protective ventilation or any other adjuvant therapy. Uh, coming to extracorporeal carbon dioxide removal, uh, you can use it for uh, facilitating an ultra lung uh, protective ventilation, but whether ultra lung protective ventilation causes an improvement in the mortality or not, that is not evident. So inhaled nitric oxide, as I already mentioned, it can maybe can be used as a bridge to ECMO because it can improve transiently uh, oxygenation. Fluid management, always uh, plan for a neutral or negative balance when, whenever the shock is absent. Glucocorticoids, again, it is a controversial topic and uh, the evidence uh, may suggest that you can use uh, steroids in case ARDS secondary to sepsis, community acquired pneumonia or a COVID-19 patient. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rahul, for your uh, concise presentation. It's over to the moderators for your remarks. Uh, thank you, Rahul. Uh, you presented it uh, very well and uh, emphasized the important uh, topics uh, in when, uh, ARDS management also. So majority of us, whenever they are, we are thinking about ARDS management, we are thinking about only the ventilatory strategies. To have a good outcome in ARDS patient, you should have hand in hand other modalities as well, like especially the fluid management. Like he has already mentioned about the FAC trial. Initial, uh, uh, like 24 hours, you may not be able to achieve a, uh, like a neutral or a negative fluid balance, especially when the patients, patients are having sepsis. But after that, we should be able to uh, uh, keep a negative fluid balance, that's very important. Then uh, Devatesar has already mentioned about 
the prone ventilation, uh, its importance uh, before itself. Uh, then obviously the neuromuscular blockade, especially when the patient is having uh, a refractory uh, hypoxemia or a severe uh, hypoxemia with a uh, low uh, PF ratio. Uh, then uh, proper sedation and agile sedation. Along with that, maintaining proper nutrition is also very, very important, especially the protein requirement we should be able to meet at least uh, uh, like 1.5 gram per kilogram per day. So if you're not uh, giving adequate uh, the protein supplementation, the chance of uh, ICU acute muscle weakness uh, will be more. Even, even if you are not meeting the calorie requirement, at least the protein requirement is very, very important. And uh, with Os Oscar Oscillate trial, the HFNO, uh, again, uh, uh, the users come down. Uh, Nobody is using uh, much of uh, high frequency ventilation nowadays. And other modalities also he has uh, mentioned. A nice uh, presentation has covered uh, most of the aspects of uh, general supportive care. And uh, so, uh, just one additional thing, if at all, saying, you know, we all said in the beginning that ARDS is often triggered off by some other illness. So treatment of that illness is extremely important. So of course, we focus on ventilatory care, supportive care in the ICU. But of course, uh, trying to diagnose the cause of the ARDS and try to sort out that root problem also goes hand in hand with all these sorts of efforts. So... For example, in our country, we've got many treatable illnesses, right? Before COVID, we had uh, malaria, we've got scrub typhus in certain parts of the country, we've got, you know, uh, dengue and so on. So you need to be, make, if you've got a surgical cause, then you need to make sure you've taken care of the surgical focus or whatever the focus of sepsis or infection is. So those things are extremely important as well. In the chat box, I don't see much quest, uh, comments. Uh, uh, there is one query on uh, nutrition in severe ARDS that itself is a topic by itself. And uh, the empirical antibiotics strategy. A panelist would like to comment on that. You don't have to give antibiotic for all ARDS patients. Only if you have uh, like suspecting a, a VAB uh, or if the patient is having a bacterial pneumonia, that is the only, uh, only area where you will have to use antibiotic. If it is a COVID pneumonia or a viral pneumonia or ARDS because of any other causes, you don't have to use uh, antibiotic at all. So don't think that you have to use antibiotic for all ARDS patients. See whether there is any focus of infection or if there is uh, any, uh, any source of infection, then you use uh, antibiotic. There is no role for prophylactic antibiotic use at all. And regarding the nutrition, which we have already discussed, uh, you will have to uh, try to maintain adequate uh, protein supplementation at least, even if you are not giving uh, the adequate calorie supplementation. Like as uh, Rahul was mentioning, this is a catabolic uh, state where you will have to uh, give uh, more uh, protein and uh, uh, protein supplementation at least. Okay, fine. So uh, we had a good session with uh, three postgraduates uh, enlightening us with uh, a concise presentation on, um, I can surely say, vast topics because ARDS per se is a topic probably we can discuss for days together, but uh, they have taken great effort to make concise presentations. Uh, shall I invite uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan for his remarks and a presentation of his certificate of appreciation to the postgraduate presenters in this PG assembly. We had a very good discussion. Thank you, Jigidivetya, Anu, and Shakti for leading the topics and clarifying the all the doubts. Our young speakers, Roy, <coughs> Anwar, and uh, <coughs> well, Rahul, they were too good to us today. They have taken up a particular area and they dealt in detail. And I'm thankful to them also for giving this sort of a real good treatise to us. And now, <coughs> thank you all.
for joining us and treating us well with this academic topic. And now we give you the e-certificate of participation, the certificate to Anwar, certificate to Roy, and certificate to Rahul. Kindly accept. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I thank you all. Thank you for the wonderful participation. Thank you, moderators and the presenters and Dr. Sanesh. Thank you and good night. We'll see this time next week. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, 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 you ma'am. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye.